he is also skeptical of our belief in what we call our immortal soul. Now remember, the psychological continuity model of the self of Descartes articulated that the real me is my mind, my soul, myself. Many of us take the concept of the soul very seriously, and it's probably because, partly because of what kind of training. And it's not Cartesian philosophical training either. I'm talking about many people's religions. Teach them that their real self is this deus ex machina, you know, the ghost in the machine, the soul. Now the problem is, if you, if you uh, got my last, ar Hume's last argument, excuse me, about the self, if the self is constantly changing, take a guess what you also ought to believe is constantly changing if you believe in one. By the same token, the soul is not stable and unchanging either. But of course, David Hume would contend that we have no good reason to believe in a separate and distinct soul from our what? From our, our perceptions. We have no reason to believe that there is this separate and distinct thing called the soul, let alone the claim that many religious people believe. Many people believe that your real self, and by the way, Descartes believed this too, that your real self, your mind soul, is something that has the potential to exist forever. Now, David Hume's argument on this point is subtle and elegant. Have you ever experienced anything in your lifetime that was immortal? The answer to that question is a resounding no. Now, if you've never experienced anything that's immortal, why do you think that you have any good reason to believe that there is this thing that you cannot see, smell, hear, touch, etc., called the soul, that is immortal? And I'll give you another Hume-style argument. We oftentimes equate our soul with our this, our consciousness. Is my conscious awareness constantly changing, or is it always the same? It's constantly changing. If I'm on cold medicine, for example, my consciousness is what I like to call a bit foggy. If I have too much to drink, if you know what I'm talking about, my consciousness becomes a bit stupid and foggy, too. When I'm asleep, my consciousness is different. Now folks, suppose that I'm in a sporting event and I get hit really hard in the head and I get concussed. You've probably heard of cases like this. Many of you have probably experienced it. Where, you, where you're like seeing weird colors and stuff. Where you're not quite sure where you are and so forth. Is your state of awareness more vivid then, or is it less vivid? Yeah, we would say it's less vivid. Now suppose that I get in an accident and I lose consciousness. Am I more aware, more conscious, or am I less aware? Less aware. Now let's take this to its furthest extension. Now suppose some sadist comes along, and I'm asleep, gets out a sledgehammer, and smashes my head like a pumpkin. Now, I don't want to get all gruesome here, but I got your attention on a Monday morning. You know, there's blood and stuff from a horror movie, like, splattered everywhere. Would it make sense to believe that at that instant, I would become more conscious than I ever was in my so-called waking life. Would it make sense to you that at the moment that my head is smashed and I'm dead, 
that I will be suddenly more conscious than I ever was in my entire life. Now, David Hume suggests that unless you're lying to yourself, what answer would you give? Yeah, it would make no sense to think that your consciousness light bulb would become brighter than it ever was during your waking life. Because, in fact, all of the evidence suggests, of our, I mean, the evidence of our experience suggests that if the brain gets injured, your selfhood dim diminishes. This thing that you call your consciousness diminishes. It makes no sense to believe that your conscious light bulb will burn brighter after you're dead than it ever did during your life. Even if you agree with Hume that his arguments make perfect sense, he knows there's a good chance you're probably not going to change your mind. And this is because why? The beliefs we hold oftentimes have nothing to do with what we have clear evidence for believing. And this is because what we're willing to believe is oftentimes psychologically motivated, not rationally motivated. Although, do keep this in mind, if you believe plenty of psychologically motivated things that are unreasonable, Beware of what you say about other people's psychologically motivated, unreasonable beliefs. Because why are my aunt's claims about astral projection and soul travel any more ridiculous than claims about reincarnation? Or any more ridiculous about beliefs in uh, you know, your religion's religious miracles? David Hume would say they are no more or no less ridiculous because they all transcend what's reasonable and they all go against what we take to be the laws of nature via our experience. That's about as hard-hitting as it gets, ladies and gentlemen. Now, two more things. You better know this one, folks. David Hume has a very interesting critique of our common sense notion of cause and effect. Now, most of us take the quote-unquote laws of cause and effect for granted. And this is partly because we tell ourselves that we see them take place on a daily basis. Take a guess what Hume will say. He will make the claim that no matter what we believe we can know, we cannot actually know this thing that we call the cause and effect relationship. Now his analysis is again both simple and elegant, but I'll have to lay it out for you. I hope in more detail than the text does. He says, let's first define what we take to be a cause. If we say that there's a causal relationship between two events, what we are saying is that there is a this. And by the way, if you read an, an, uh, an unabridged version of David Hume, the word connection will actually be spelled with an X here. I kind of I'm just throwing that out there for you historically. I actually wish we would go back to the archaic spelling. The letter X doesn't get a whole lot of love, you may have noticed, in a lot of English language words. And connection, I mean, we actually pronounce it like an X. Yeah, I wish we'd go back and give the letter X some love. But anyway, I'm having a little too much fun with this here. He says, do we ever actually see a necessary connection between two events? He says, no. He says, this is what we actually witness when we think we're witnessing cause and effect. In one instant, we'll call this instant one, we'll call this instance two. We will see an event that we call A happen. And shortly thereafter, what will happen? 
we will see B happen. Now, if, if this succession of events only happened once, we would probably think nothing of it. However, if on the next instance, A happens, and then not long after we witness B happening, we might be starting to think to ourselves, I wonder if this event A happening has anything to do with event B happening. Now if it happens again, we're becoming more, uh, what shall I say, thinking more likely that there's something going on. We see it happen again. And then what will our minds do? And this is the key. We never actually see a connection between A and B. We see one event following the other. And our minds, our mind fills the, the causal arrow in. We infer that the two events must be connected to one another. Because this is what we have actually witnessed according to Hume. What we actually witness is what David Hume calls a constant correlation or a constant conjunction. Now most of you know, I've heard what about correlation? Correlation does always mean causation. Yeah, correlation does not necessarily mean causation. Correlation merely means that when we've seen this happen, we've also seen this happen. According to Hume, it is our mind that fills in what we think is a necessary connection. And we do it because of our powers of reasoning. We are inducing via our experience, because we see this happen numerous times and B follows it. So we tell ourselves, the next time A happens, you would predict what? That B will happen. And you know what? It is reasonable that if you've seen it always happen this way in the past, to suspect that if A happens, that B will happen again. But you can't what? You A can't know that there's a necessary connection because you never actually see the necessary connection. All you ever see is the correlation. You cannot know for certain that the two events are connected. That goes beyond our rational powers. That goes beyond our rational powers. Because what we're doing is we are taking the data of our experience and we are making a prediction about the what? About future experiences. But for all we know, the next experience might turn out how? Might turn out differently. I would bet money that it won't turn out differently. However, we cannot know for certain that the next time A happens, that B will follow. Because our only evidence for it is our, is our past experience. For an illegal time. Now I'm running out of time here. You better know this for, for our next session. But Kant's account of morality, as well as his account of cause and effect, are two of the things that the philosopher Immanuel Kant will say awaken him from his dogmatic slumber. Number one, because our assumption that we can know cause and effect is something that is foundational for our understanding of, of how science works as well as the laws of nature. 
Now, his critique of our common sense view of morality will be just as devastating according to the philosopher Immanuel Kant. And this is why he's going to argue that there must be a flaw somewhere in Hume's argument. Now, here's his argument. David Hume is going to make the claim that we cannot know any kind of absolute moral truths. And this is because every single one of our experiences is a what? All of our experiences are of perceptions. In other words, when we describe our experiences, we are making empirical claims about the way things about the way things are. The thing is, moral claims are not these kinds of claims. Moral statements are are what we call value claims or value judgments. Value judgments don't describe how things are. They describe what? How things ought to be or th how things should be. Now what David Hume argues is this. Take any case that you take to be immoral. And David Hume will say you are not talking about any kind of statements that are absolutely true. What you are doing is you are importing your what when you call something wrong. You are importing in your feelings or your sentiments. Now the author of our text includes what kind of picture in the book when talking about this issue. A happy, recently married lesbian couple. A happy-looking, recently married lesbian couple. Now, is there anything about two people of the same sex getting married? Is there anything intrinsically wrong with that taking place that merely talks about these? That talks about only the facts? David Hume says the answer to that question is no. Because any time you, you describe the situation, there will be nothing in that description that will talk about rightness or wrongness. You say, they are, and how did I describe it? I said, a happy looking lesbian couple who had recently gotten married. Now, what Hume will say is, your assertions about its right or wrongness really don't derive from the facts. They derive from your what? By your feelings about those facts. Whatever you name, whatever moral problem we might name, Hume would say if you gave a purely perceptual description of that, there would be nothing in your description that would say anything about what? Rightness or wrongness? Rightness and wrongness are value judgments derived from our own personal subjective feelings about things. And by the way, it was not, uh, it was, was not lost on David Hume that most of us have similar viewpoints about what's right and wrong because our views about right and wrong typically come from where? Our experiences. Yeah. I'm going to use this word. Because we tend to be acculturated in similar ways. So you ought not to be surprised why 50 years ago the average American would have said homosexuality is an is a moral abomination. Fifty years ago, most people would have said homosexuality is a moral abomination. 
Now, of course, if you ask them why they believed it was wrong, David Hume would say they would be going beyond the facts. They would be ended up talking about various value judgments that cannot be what? That cannot be proven in an empirical sense. And if you start to say the Bible says, what is it, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve? You say you're already importing your own viewpoint that what the Bible says is true. He says, and on top of that, if you say, well, it's wrong because I think it's disgusting. Well, guess what? Does something's being disgusting to you make it absolutely wrong in and of itself? I hope your answer to that is no. Because there's some things that you probably do that other people would call absolutely disgusting. Because disgustingness is all a matter of perspective anyway. Now take a guess why Hume's account here is dangerous. Because if you take his argument to the logical extreme, we have no clear grounds for calling anything intrinsically right or wrong in any kind of absolute sense. Because any time you talk about rightness and wrongness, you are ultimately talking about how you feel about those things. And your feelings are this. And your feelings are subjective. Your feelings are subjective. And traditionally speaking, folks, when we have typically thought about moral rightness and wrongness, take a guess what is almost always thought of as supposed to be out of the equation. Subjectivity. In other words, when we're doing any kind of good rational analysis, we are supposed to be being unbiased and objective. The problem is, Hume would say, that's not, that's not what we do whenever we talk about morality. We talk about our feelings, but we kind of conveniently ignore that we're talking about our feelings. And if you say abortion is wrong because it stops a beating heart, what you're really saying is this, that you think that lives matter, especially lives that I care about, and whenever those abstract potential infant lives are stopped from being able to be born, that makes me feel distressed. In other words, you're not talking about something rational, you're talking about your feelings. Same way about if you say stealing is wrong. What you're basically saying is, I feel bad when people take things from me. And I infer that other people feel the same way when their stuff is taken from them. But then you try to construct these rational, absolutist kind of arguments that hides the fact that it's actually your sentiments that led you to think that way. Not some kind of abstract, rational, moral law. Because those things in the grand scheme of things are not what motivate our behavior anyway. If somebody tries to tell you that they helped a person out because they believed it was meet and right to follow the moral law, they're probably lying to you, but more than anything, they're lying to themselves. I don't help people out because of following the moral law, according to Hume. I help people out because I feel sympathy for people, and my sympathy leads me to want to help people whom I feel what for? Whom I feel that sympathy for. Well, I hope that you got a good sense of what his critique of morality is like. It will show up again. Cheers until next time.